90% of people in the United States have one or more specific PFASs in their blood. They've become pervasive. Uh, they're in shampoo, in paint, in food packaging, in firefighting foam, as Delegate Lopez talked about extensively, um, and nonstick pans. Human exposure to PFAS is a growing public health concern nationwide. Studies suggest that exposure may adversely affect fertility, cholesterol levels, and increase the risk of some forms of cancer. Uh, this bill is a common sense measure to keep PFAS out of food packaging in Virginia. The linings of um, cups <coughs> in particular is one of the primary sources of leaching. Uh, this is a move that will help protect Virginians from exposure to this harmful forever chemical. Once they're in your system, they, they don't disappear. These are not um, chemicals that are meant to, to be degradable in that way. So um, HB 1712 prohibits the sale, offer for sale, or distribution for sale, or use of any food packaging containing PFAS chemicals um, defined in the bill as a class of these organic chemicals so that the appropriated appropriate um, scientific detail it, uh, with at least one fully fluorinated carbon atom. Uh, the penalty for violating the prohibition is Thank you, Delegate Hudson. Delegate Marshall, question? So, a uh, question for the uh, patron. Um, is this similar to what uh, Lopez's bill that we did not pass? So, it, it, what's different about them is the materials. So, Delegate Lopez's bill concerned uh, the foam in furniture, because he was primarily concerned about firefighters who are exposed to, to inhalation, um, and also in children's products. Um, children, these, these uh, chem chemicals are particularly harmful if you're exposed as a child. Um, this would target a different um, class of exposure, which is in the lining of wheat products, um, which is another common way in which people can be False question. So we had another bill also that did say time Lopez. Was yeah. it Simon's bill? Uh, uh, no, it's Samira. Samira. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Yes. All right. So what's the difference between uh, that bill and that's an Delegate Hudson? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I could look it up to be fair. I don't, I don't remember exactly which forms. He was concerned with waterways. Is that correct? He was concerned, I think, about the testing of um, about the appropriate level that could be found in water waste. That's my memory. No, no, Is that? Um, not sure. Do you remember? No, yeah, <laughs> Madam Chair, it, it was, it was on, I don't remember the exact chemicals, but it was, it was on these lines of banning, banning chemicals. I thought it, it was be, It was be, uh, BPA. BPA. This was about BPA and water waste. So, yeah. Madam Chair, I, I thought his pertained to also in, in drinking cups and that type of, I, I believe. But yeah. No, that's right. Uh, I, my take on this was that Delegate Hudson's bill was dealing more with like drinking cups, like plastic uh, paper cups that we get, and he was talking about water bottles, those kinds of things. Am I wrong? Uh, Madam Chair, the, the memory was also correct. He was talking about a different class of compounds. Mm -hmm. um, the Part of the reason why they're easily confused, BPA and PFAS, is because they're both pervasive um, in, in plastic lines. Any more questions from the committee? Sure, not so much a question, but just I, I'm trying to read the bill back from or two or three weeks ago, whenever it was. And I believe that the main difference, in addition to the chemical category, is the fact that the bills, if I remember Delegate Lopez and Delegate Samira's bills, would ban the manufacture of those products as well as sales and et cetera. My, based on one quick reading I just did, uh, Delegate Hudson's bill doesn't get into the manufacturing side, it only prohibits the sales. Is that a different way that we could look at this. In other words, to, when, you, when you talk about banning manufacturing, you're bringing interesting commerce. I mean, there are <coughs> companies all around the country that make the product, which we have no control over. But if you're saying banning the sale of, then then at least it limits us slightly to at least what we can control in Virginia. So that's at least maybe one policy difference, if I recall. Madam Chair, Delegate King, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Any further comments or questions from the table? So just follow-up question with along what uh, King was talking about. So if we uh, are going to ban those products from, from out of state coming in state, so what type of products are we talking about? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. The common common things would include uh, takeout containers, deli paper, cups. Thank you.
table. Do we have people in the room who would like to speak in support of this bill? Go ahead, introduce yourself. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Grace McGuire. I'm with the Virginia League of Conservation Voters. Um, we uh, very excitedly support this bill. I've also been tapped to let y'all know that the BCN also supports this bill. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Steve Carter Lovejoy. I'm a volunteer with the Sierra Club, and I also support this bill. It has, it has been um, now uh, installed in two states, in Maine and in Washington, um, although it ha isn't in place yet because they, they are taking some time to implement it, um, including finding out exactly which products uh, need, to be, need to be banned. So uh, it, it's a, it, it is a complicated issue, but it's an important one, and I support it. Thank you, sir. Delegate Poindexter? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask the witness, is, is FDA or EPA um, banned these? No. They, they, they've worked on it, um, but uh, in the current uh, climate, uh, uh, a lot of the work that they've done has, has been stopped. That's a follow-up question. Go so ahead. could they, as far as you know, the EPA and, and um, the FDA um, have not ruled that this is harmful um, to human beings at a low percentage? I, I, they have not put regulations in place. Um, I think there's been a lot of study. There are some, uh, there are some uh, standards, that, the guidelines that they've that they've promulgated. But I don't think that there are uh, there are any laws uh, in place at this point. Thank you. Any more to speak in support? I just, just to like paint a better picture, um, the EPA has um, said that just just. To paint a better picture of what this chemical is, it is a from, it is a forever, forever chemical. It doesn't go away in the body, so it accumulates. And because of that, high cholesterol has been distinctively noted by the EPA to be caused by these high chemicals. So that's yeah. Thank you. Anyone? Oh, well, go ahead, ma'am. Uh, Tyler Madison, and I'm speaking as an individual citizen in Virginia, and uh, I strongly support this. Um, I've been doing as much research as I can as, as an individual about it. And uh, and I think that Virginia can go ahead and take the lead along with some of the other states that are doing it, even if EPA hasn't quite done it yet. Thank, Thank you. you. Any more to, to speak in support? Go ahead. Oh, just okay. speaking to this point, I would note that these chemicals have been identified by the EPA as matters of emerging concern, which is their way to say that they are currently um, studying the matter. Um, for those of us who are being exposed to them, there's not a lot of time to wait. Yeah, that's true. Um, Delegate Poindexter? Thank you for your comment. But they also studied several hundred new compounds like this, and they didn't give them time to see the emerging trends. That's, not, that's what they're supposed to be doing. That's Thank you, um, Anyone here to speak in opposition of this bill? Yes. Good afternoon. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. I'm Mike Carlin, representing the Virginia Manufacturers Association and the Virginia Retail Federation. I um, want to just at the outset uh, state that this bill has not passed in any state, according to our research. Um, we're in opposition to the bill because the PFASs used in package, food packaging materials are subject to very strict regulation already by the FDA. regulated as food additives. Um, the FDA uses the term food contact substance to describe food additives in packaging materials. And before a food contact substance can be sold or distributed <coughs> in commerce, it must be reviewed by the FDA. And uh, the, the FDA can only provide an authorization for a food <coughs> contact substance in the, if the agency concludes that there is sufficient scientific data to demonstrate that the substance is safe for its intended use in packaging. Uh, the FDA requires extensive scientific data up front uh, in order to demonstrate that the food contact substance is safe for its intended use. The FDA requires submission of extensive test data and scientific information regarding the chemical composition uh, of the food contact substance the levels of impurities that may be released from the food, uh, toxicity data, and the FDA has the authority to 
review on, on, on a, in an ongoing manner um, these this substance and other substances and may withdraw if it concludes that it is not safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I am falling down on my job. I should be asking people to speak as briefly as possible. Hello, Mr. Street. Madam Chair, very quickly, Kyle Street, Virginia Agribusiness Council. Our objections do track along with Delegate Samir's bill in that it uh, it uh, does interfere with our paper company's recycling efforts, uh, specifically on line 19, in which it says PAS, PFAS chemicals in any amount, uh, which would mean trace amounts used in recycling efforts through no intention of our companies. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Susan Sewer, Virginia Forest Products Association. And again, uh, we share the same concerns that Mr. Shreve with the Agribusiness Council. It would, in effect, be an all out ban on the recycled food packaging. So, thank you. Any more to speak in opposition? Go ahead. Madam Chair, my name is Katie, Katie Hollabush with the Virginia Forestry Association. Um, I wanted to um, align myself with the comments of the previous speakers um, and respectfully um, ask that y'all oppose the bill. This would have a large impact on uh, the um, Virginia forestry um, industry. Um, I mean, that, that 16 million acres of Virginia is in forest land, and two thirds of that are owned by individuals. Mm -hmm love to keep their family um, forest land um, going for generations. So we want to make sure that they're able to do that. And obviously, banning um, this would ultimately impact the products. Thank you. Yes. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Parker Slave of the Virginia Food Industry Association, and I'll echo the, the concerns already expressed. But I did ask one of our members to kind of just provide a, a list of going along some of the questions that y'all were asking of some products that would have to come off the shelf should this have passed. Some of the things they sent back were cake boards, parchment paper, cookie boxes, muffin donut bags and boxes, soup containers, and also other to-go um, containers along with uh, different types of craft paper. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Madam Chair, so uh, I just want to speak briefly to this bill so that we were on the same page. I just read the other two bills <coughs> we did. And, uh, and, it, yeah, and I'll have a motion. Uh, the two bills, the three bills, Delegate Lopez's bill, Delegate Samira's bill, and Delegate Hudson's bills are interesting because on some, they go further. On some, hers goes further. Uh, the part that we talked about in terms of manufacturers being brought in, Lopez and Samira's do that. But they, uh, you know, they have the same concern. On the other hand, Delegate Hudson's bill <coughs> has a criminal penalty, not civil. The other two have civil penalties. So this would be a violation that would result in a class two misdemeanor, which is uh, might be a little bit more than we would like to see uh, compared to civil penalty of 5,000 or 10,000 per incident in the other two bills. The other major change that I see, and maybe this is because it was drafted towards a, a criminal uh, misdemeanor, but on line 19, it has two ways that you can violate this. One is if you have a product that contains it in any amount, which uh, Mr. Slavo just mentioned, but or which PFAS chemicals have been intentionally added. And that brings in this thing in this legal terminology called mens rea, which is you need an intent, you, have, you need a mindset that says, I want to do something bad in order for that to become a crime. If you did that unintentionally, then it's not a crime because you didn't have the act as well as the mens rea that goes with it. So this turns it into more of a criminal statute, which then I would not, I wouldn't want to do this, but with rather than the HWI, the other Courts with the other, which we don't want to do. So I think to protect uh, Delegate Hudson from that fate, I might suggest that we uh, just carry this over with the understanding that uh, we will work with each other and with stakeholders to see if we can come back next year with something that's a little bit you know, less onerous as far as the penalties, but maybe trying to narrow down the problem that we're trying to solve and see if, see if we can try something new. And as you know, Delegate, uh, Madam Chair, my colleagues here, I mean, I, I try really hard to solve the problem and not do something that just an agenda per se, so to the extent that we're willing to, I'd like to work with the delegate and others to see if we come back with something that's a little bit more narrow and reasonable. So with that, my motion would be to just carry it over under Rule 42. Second. All right, we have a motion to carry it over, and that is, has been seconded. And all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion is carried. Thank you, Delegate Hudson. And we have one more patron. Uh, Madam Chair, I apologize for the last time. Uh, the Chairman of Appropriations kept us and uh, wouldn't let us out of jail. So.
Um, I uh, had two in front of you. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, 349, if uh, we'd like to do that one first, it's just the body. Um, so House Bill 349 is, um, is based on uh, some uh, conversations that I had back in Hampton Roads of uh, some false advertising, misleading advertising, lying, you know, you can insert the word you kind of want. Um, but uh, with, with it's it happening, or what? I, I know, I know, I know. It's uh, so it's, the concern that they're having is that um, uh, there are entities out there putting individuals in white laboratory coats and jackets or other medical attire who are not doctors um, to portray uh, that the comments made um, in uh, hemp CBD product advertisements are medical uh, in nature from a medical professional. Uh, all this bill does is to say that uh, that um, any person who's not credentialed as a medical professional cannot wear a light laboratory coat, jacket, or other medical attire or devices in a hemp product advertisement uh, that could reasonably be expected to portray that person as a medical professional. Madam yeah, Chair. Sure. I've got car dealers in white jackets trying to sell me a Buick. Uh, so, <laughs> 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 not unless it comes with hemp, also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Green jacket, yeah. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Any questions for patrons? Now we got tapers. Do you have a substitute? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I don't know. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> Does the substitute make it any better? Then we'll take it. Uh, Madam Chair, Delic Davis, it was a, an option for you, same text but in a more appropriate Yes, text. I apologize, different section. Yes, um, the, the attorneys uh, <laughs> know much better. I, were, I, I usually look at substitutes as far as the language. Uh, they located that we had an issue where I put it, so I apologize. All right. Um, someone? Do you have substitute? Uh, Move the substitute. Yeah. Second. All in favor? Are there any questions for the uh, Delicate Madam Chair, I would pose a question to my venerable colleague uh, that Ooh. if this is a advertisement, isn't that considered acting? So first, I'm going to a dictionary and look up the word venerable, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, so, it, so would it be, cons I don't know whether Madam Chair would be considered acting. Um, However, um, the issue is not that they act as such as much as they're in the advertisement portraying as such. So I would say that someone can maybe act a part in their house with no issues whatsoever, but the minute it turns into an advertisement for such product, uh, then that would be the issue. Madam Chair, with further question, would we also say that this probably would be a um, pushing on free speech? Um, Madam Chair, I would, I would say it pushes on free speech as much as misrepresentation of other medical products that we already uh, uh, stepped in front of and outlaw uh, impedes on free speech. Um, just as the FDA already prohibits you from coming out with uh, claims about different products that are not true or that not have been uh, substantiated, uh, you're, it's illegal to do, but it does not, it, but, it, you know, but obviously it, uh, it may inhibit what people consider free speech. So I would say it's in the same vein. Yes, ma'am. Are there other industries where white posts are common in advertising, though? I seem the to. Beard dealer. <laughs> oh, you said the beard dealer. Um, Madam Chair, I would say, to my knowledge, not in the medical field. I, you know, I, I, I grew up in the days of, uh, of, um, uh, goodness. So I can picture it. Uh, the Manny Vice, and back then everyone had a white jacket and white pants, right? So, um, uh, I, and I, you know, so maybe someone's got a white sport coat on, different things, but not. Yeah, Delica Davis, I just thought of the industry that was uh, that was evading me, um, eluding me. It's the cosmetic industry. Yes, ma'am. We see that all the time. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm afraid that in my world, it's probably out there. I think the, the white coats are out there. Madam Chair, I, I understand. So um, they wear the white in the uh, in the makeup industry uh, because they want to portray how clean that you can be while putting this stuff on and the cleanliness of the person. Uh, so, and ice cream, I, I can't claim the white is for ice cream, but what I can do is we've limited this solely for hemp products. So anyone that wants to wear a white jacket is, is inclined to, and you'd also see the protection and measure 
as well, Madam Chair, that is there, which is it can be reasonably be expected to portray such person as a medical professional. Um, so it gets sort of all accidental uh, portrays of someone that happens to be in a white sport coat. Um, uh, but it's solely limited to hemp products being advertised and solely where it's obvious that they're trying to, uh, uh, to uh, well, mis mis uh, uh, mislead the public. Thank you, Delegate. Um, any more questions, comments from the table? People in the audience supporting this bill? Yes, Sway, hi. Please, quickly. Uh, I'm Regina Whitsett. I'm the Executive Director of SAFE, we're the Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition in Chesterfield County, and I'm also a member of Community Coalitions of Virginia, which represents 50 coalitions across the state. And we are actually in support of this bill because we've been, we've seen in California, Colorado, Washington State, we're in these um, medical marijuana shops. Actually, people have been wearing the white coats and representing themselves as medical professionals. And we think that's what's happening here in the CBD shops with the hemp products as well. However, we don't think that this um, bill goes far enough. We would like to request um, that the Board of Agriculture actually do regulation of advertising, including billboards and street signs and banners for these um, hemp and CBD shops that are out on the roadways. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jen Michelle Fadini uh, on behalf of the National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws and the state affiliate, uh, Virginia Normal, here simply to offer, uh, at the request of the patron, a little bit of expertise on this particular area. Uh, the FTC and FDA are very explicit in the um, mandate that health claims cannot be made on these products and to uh, echo Ms. Witsett's uh, recommendations. Um, while this seems to be very narrow, it would be appropriate to have state law be reflective of, of mandates by the FDA and FTC. And, and if you drive down uh, a number of streets in Richmond right now, you would, you would see those violations. Thank you. Anyone else in support? Anyone, are you, no? no? Okay, anyone in opposition? Go ahead. Barbara Miller representing the Virginia Industrial Hemp Coalition, the Hemp Hub of Central Virginia, and Save the Earth Hemp. <coughs> no one industry owns white coats. To forbid it, we feel, is um, over-regulation. It starts a slippery slope of micromanagement of an industry that is already overburdened by pe federal regulations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ma'am, sure if I can respond just briefly. Absolutely. And I appreciate the comments. Actually, the, the additional uh, billboard stuff, you'll see in a bill in just 30 seconds. Uh, that's a different one we have coming. The other thing I would mention to uh, the industry leaders, I, if you know me, you know I don't like regulations. Uh, I don't like limiting things, but I do believe in safety of the public. Additionally, Virginia Commonwealth University put out a, uh, a study in August of last year uh, where Dr. Peace there uh, and his team did discovered that a synthetic compound um, had been utilized and the Drug Enforcement Administration had uh, linked it to anxiety, convulsions, psycho psychosis, hospitalization, and even death. But the CBD industry is trying to utilize the benefits of medical CBD oil that is a totally different, heavily regulated industry. So this is uh, very important that we don't allow people to present themselves as doctors for training this product and continue to confuse it with medical CBD oil, which is heavily regulated and overseen by the FDA or by the Commonwealth and, uh, and the uh, federal government. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate uh, Madam Chair, I, I, I appreciate where you're coming from on this and that uh, Delegate Davis is a, a very good close friend and I understand concerns he has, but uh, not only do we right. not have but the wrong section, uh, Title uh, 59 in Virginia Code is <coughs> the Deceptive Practices Law, and I think there are plenty of existing law that would cover the concerns that you raised, including things like misrepresenting the affiliation, connection, and association of supplies of goods with services with another, <coughs> representing that goods and services have certain quantities, characteristics, ingredients, uses, benefits, etc., etc. The reason why the Deceptive Practices Law is vague is because we cannot legislate on every single advertisement that's on TV, because otherwise we'd be spending all our time filling out this code book with a thousand examples a day of those uh, people that come on TV advertising. And, and how would we ever advertise? Well, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And so uh, my concern is much broader than this particular concern. I do agree that new m emerging products like hemp are creating an opportunity for people to try to deceive as medical products, but 
you go down the list. I mean, every vitamin, every, you know, you name it. So I just think that as, as a state, we have to be very, very, very careful about trending to the First Amendment because it's such a case-by-case -case basis. I used to, back in my old days, I used to practice in this area, and the reason why the Supreme Court has such vague decisions and the way laws are created is because the First Amendment, by definition, is not supposed to be codified and statutorily created. So I think that the law already covers those concerns, and I would urge that uh, industry work within the reasonable standards that's already in place. And so with that, I would gently lay a bill on the table. Move to gently lay a bill on the table. Second. We have a motion to lay the bill on the table. A couple of seconds. Sorry, Brad. <laughs> we got a chance to speak well? Oh, oh. oh, I'm sorry. We got two people to speak. I think it's going, it's going, going your way. way. Oh, OK. My bad. <laughs> All right. My confusion. We will register others, please.
hardware, you get the abode <coughs> and you get the deed. Ma Madam Chair, Kyle Shree <laughs> with Virginia Agribusiness Council. Uh, no, it is just a reimbursement program for the equipment only. Uh, the, uh, the individual who's going to be the beekeeper would then supply it with the hive. The point was to try to encourage uh, more hives. Thank you. You know that wasn't really the point of this, but. Yeah, so you support or? We, we do support, sir. and, and one other thing I will add is one of the things that was brought to our attention by some of our managers, other than the per household uh, uh, piece that Delegate Wilk mentioned, was the during the application period, uh, as uh, all of you are uh, uh, aware, uh, we do have problems with broadband access in the Commonwealth, uh, and so the previous the previous the previous language said that it was first come first serve. And the department set up an online system, and they were gone before someone could get to a computer to sign up. It was the same day access ran out. And I did have a few of our members uh, asked to try to fix, fix that. If you look at line 13, during the application process, we had a time period of not less than 15 days. And then VDAX will select at random, and we did run this by VDAX uh, to make sure. Uh, they will select at random to try to get better distribution to solve uh, Delegate Wilt's problem <coughs> and also give us some time in the interim to allow those that do not have access in those rural localities to broadband time uh, and, and an ability to uh, participate in the program. Thank you. We do support the bill. Thank you. Thank you. So I see somebody from VDAC just going through the back there hiding if they're able to come forward. Actually, if they're not hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Nichols, VDAC. So the question is, is that uh, like what we heard from W. Wilt, that uh, na you know, neighbor one, two, three could get on the vehicle. Have you looked at trying to locate them and maybe geographically uh, all over the state, or is it? Uh, well, because the way it's written, is we we had to take them first come, first serve, or in the order in which the applications were submitted. So for that reason, we just had to process them, and it didn't. It could all have been in one small <coughs> geographic area. Would it not? Would it not make more sense to try to we could change Tony's law and, and so that uh, we can put them you know throughout the state? Uh, so if we only have a certain amount of money, uh, unanimous consent. Well, he, uh, we can we can uh, amend this Good. bill, I guess. Yeah. Couldn't we? Yeah. Uh, is it would it be Jermaine? Council. Madam Chair, I, that's the decision. I assume is left to the speaker, but uh, I think that would be in keeping with the spirit of the bill. Well, in keeping with the beekeepers. Um, <laughs> Madam Chair, I would, I would yield uh, to the gentleman, but I, uh, I kind of thought that was the direction they were. I, here would be one of the problems we would encounter. When we when we opened it up this year on July 1, we received over 3,000 applications uh, oh, wow. from midnight until 3 p.m. I mean, yeah, 3 p.m. So we cut it off at that point. Um, this wow. says two weeks, and we put it at two weeks so that those <coughs> that either have slow internet or no internet have the opportunity to mail it in. Once we do that, we're going to open that up for two weeks, and I can't tell you how many applications we're going to get. So then if we have to make sure that they're evenly distributed, and I'm not real sure how we would do that, but if we have to go to that step, it takes an added... Um, evaluation on our part and if we go from th we had to evaluate 3,000 this time the way we've set it up here is it's really going to be an, an automatic if you complete the application verify that you're a, a Virginia resident then your application is going to be complete there would be no evaluation of that application whereas if we have to make sure they're evenly distributed we would have to evaluate them and that would take a long time to evaluate 20 say let's just say 20,000 applications that might come in in a two week I have a question. How many are being distributed? How many hives? Yeah. Well, it's it's one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. Now we don't know how many hives, but I can tell you that last year we distributed uh, between nine hundred and fifty and a thousand hives um, to three hundred and sixty-five <laughs> applicants. So they can get anywhere. I can't tell you that number because they can get anywhere from one to three, a maximum of three, and then it also depends on the cost of the individual hive. You have beehive unit itself. So we have a contract right now with the vendor that the price is already established um, and it's averaging around $125 a hive. 
Go ahead, Debbie. Well, Madam Chair, I, I think I, I agree with um, Debbie Marshall that absolutely I support the bill, and uh, absolutely you need more tools. The only concern I have is that even with the language of being picked at random, I wonder how random it could be if the result is that everybody who just automatically through whatever computer system you use end up at being in the same location or, or close enough. So I wonder if it's not too difficult, and this might be something that uh, our secretary or somebody could answer. It might be just a matter of a few code changes in the software to have when you're applying online, you make sure that the, uh, the zip code pops up. And then by kind of geographically saying there are five regions of the state and the zip codes fall into those categories. So we can have a little bit of criteria that says uh, random to, to the extent you can replace, I mean, I come up with five or six or seven regions because the words at random to me doesn't give enough guidance to these folks to say that we will try to reach some kind of a policy goal. So I would, if there's a way that we can talk about receiving beehive units at random in a way where it actually ends up with some better dispersion, I would be more comfortable with that. Otherwise, we might be in the same position that you're in, just that the only thing you've done is extend the deadline and you try to make it as anonymized as possible. A couple things. Um, Martha, uh, would you want to look at uh, you know, planning districts that you put you that beforehand, before you put the applications out, that you would say we need X number in each one of the one pick planning districts just you know, for conversation? So maybe we could do that. But the other thing is, are, are people getting these hives in residential areas? I mean, my next door neighbor, who I live in a residential area, can he get a hive? To me, I think you'd want him to have them on the farm, not next door to me, stinging me while I'm cutting the grass. There's, there's no restriction on where they, who can receive, so they can be in urban or residential areas. Would we not want them to put them on the farm? Yeah, Madam Chair, I mean, it's not not everybody wants to fool with me. Yeah, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. Yeah. Um. I'll take that one. So, uh, <laughs> Kyle Shreve, Virginia Agribusiness Council. Uh, I, I agree with you, uh, Delegate Marshall, that we would want it. Uh, you know, I want as many of my members to have access to it that, that want them. However, I don't want to limit the ability. I think that you run a very fine line there trying to define a geographic area. Pollinators are important everywhere uh, in all kinds. We are we're trying to focus on uh, urban and local agriculture as well uh, at this point in time. I, I would hesitate to try to start to go down a road in which we're now walking a very fine line. Um, to those by, I, did, I agreed with the, uh, Delegate Wilt's underlying premise that we want to try to spread it out though in order to diversify the area in which we have hives. Um, however, I also don't want to put a very large fiscal burden uh, if the current software program does not do it, I fear that that would cause harm to the bill fiscally, uh, especially this year. Um, I'm happy to look at it, keep working on it. We, we worked with Delegate Wilt this year. I'm happy to bring it back next year. If for some reason the program doesn't work, my, my opinion uh, would be to, uh, for, for what it's worth, would be to try it for this year, see the response VDEX gets and where it goes, and then we try to narrow it down next year. Does that sound sensible? Yes, ma'am, Chair. Sure. But I'll try. Martha, were you going to? Um, to help the dis Martha Moore, Virginia Farm Bureau, um, Madam Chairman, um, to help the discussion, what you could do is add in an admin clause and ask for a report back to the subcommittee to see how the geographic dis distribution, as well as ask VDAX to look at is there a simple way to make this geographically dispersed and come back with any recommendations. If, and, and that way they would know, to your point, well, I know a few changes to a coding, but in state government we can't get any of these websites changed because of the process that you have to go through. So while I understand that that should be simple, unfortunately our experience has been it's not. But I think what we can do is, I think they've heard the discussion, <coughs> ask them to come back with the report and figure out if um, how we could do this better. Would an enactment clause, sorry, slow down this year's no. distribution process? No, so an enactment, so you would pass this bill and the enactment yeah. clause just directs the department yeah, to have a, to have a uh, report back to the committee with regards to um, an explanation of how it was distributed, <coughs> what kind of experience they had, and then if, and to further have some type of discussions with regards to the geographic distribution so that there is some, some other way. And we can work with them to come up with the language, it's a concept. 
but but that's how you could solve this as an enactment clause to come back to you to continue this conversation. Thank you. Well, just a quick question though. Uh, what what is the deadline we're talking about here? Because it's right now it just says an application period. But what what kind of year do, does this happen? <laughs> we, well, we'll start at July one. So <coughs> July one. We're talking July one to July fifteenth would be that window. Right. And, and the way we set it up by have it because it's fifteen days. If for some reason we don't spend all hundred and twenty five thousand, we can go for another fifteen day period. But in, but we would in. Uh, our plan would be it would go from July, start July 1 and go for that 15 days. Well, uh, well one question there. The lines 14, 15 say not less than 15 days, so it doesn't have to be 15, but then it also means that you can keep it open for a whole year. Oh, yes, we could. Man, well, do we want to keep up? Cause it, it wouldn't be fair to keep it open for a whole year either. It's oversubscribed. He's over a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> he's over a lot of money in 15 <laughs> days. Yeah. 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 Money yeah. in 15 days. Madam Chair, I mean, you heard the testimony. They were they were uh, that many applicants in a uh, twelve hours or whatever. Uh, fifteen hours. Yeah, fifteen hours. You want to do that? They were. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, Madam Chair, I would. I'm, I'm certainly uh, agreeable to the enactment that, and, and I bet you. Well, no, I'm not going to put these yeah. on the spot, but they know where these things are going, and yeah, it'd be it'd be great information to. Madam Chair. Uh, okay. But but I do. You know, the overall intent of. I, right now, I don't know that we can fine tune this anymore. I think the attempt to, to at least so that we we three don't have them all in our own household, but so, you know, at least get them down the road to the neighbors. Let me ask me a question. So, if we pass this, it becomes <laughs> law on July one. On July one, you are out there uh, you get, taking the phone calls. Is that going to be a problem? Uh, do we maybe? Get, need to get you to go to July 15th to do, you know. Well, I guess we could, but this is what we did last year. We were we were ready. In fact, Delegate Wilp had a bill in last year that revised it a little bit, and we were ready on July 1. We have the website up and ready to go. Okay. So we'll be ready. And, and as far as the enactment clause in the report, we have shipping addresses for every person that receives these Beehive units. So it would just be a matter of plotting those out on a, on a map to show where they where they went. Start the, the application period is Ju would be say July one through the fifteenth. However, we don't finish dispersing them all because we work oh. with an applicator. Uh, I mean, I mean a vendor, and uh, for them to get nine hundred hives out takes takes a while. So that's a good point. I'm not sure that we could have a report <coughs> back to you by. Um, well, well, we're finished. We're just now finishing up. Uh, we throw motion. Well, Madam, Madam Chair, but you could you could provide information for 2018. Right. 2007. Oh, we, yeah, that's exactly right. So, yes. so that, I mean, a lot of the reports that we get, a lot of things are only up here. You know, they ended two, only up to two or three years ago. And I think it was the picture that we're looking for here, you could certainly paint. And, and, and Madam Chair, I, I would suggest in the report, maybe, do we want maybe like a five year history? Is that too much trouble? Well, we, to, yeah. If we're looking at disbursement, because yeah. I, the beehive hopefully is not a one and done. Or, or yeah, it is a one and done. We, hope you, we give you a hive, you're not coming back necessarily every your hive dies. We're we're hoping to 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 spread the thing out. Um, that that makes it so. I'm just it, but it was a different pro the, the current program yeah, we have is a, in a uh, where we distribute the equipment. The prior was where we reimbursed you for your expenses in purchasing equipment. So uh, I think it would probably be better if we stuck with the past. 
uh, two years, um, that would give us a better idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I would just have a different motion, which is to help you. I don't believe that we need an amendment clause for that purpose because obviously we're talking about the same folks that are in this room and we can always pick up the phone and talk to them directly and get this information. It, the only reason we wanted to have some kind of an official report back is if we were to anticipate changes to the law next year, but at this stage, I don't think that's necessary. The, the main thing is to get this off the ground running, so my motion is to move to support this bill. As amended. As second. Um, I think we need to move uh, yeah. As amended. Uh, all in favor? What? Well, I'm just seeing a possible comment from Martha. You could also send the chair to, at the chair, you could send a letter to them and just yeah. ask for the information, yeah. and then you could distribute it to the committee. So they're, they're right. You don't necessarily need an admin clause. You could send a letter to the chair of the subcommittee and ask for that information. As, as Chairman Plum asked for the report and make it a presentation <coughs> first next year. We're kind of assuming, and I, I make the assumption too, that this person would be better scientifically. It might be that Ajax says that's not the thing to do. So I would like some professional scientific information. All right. Okay. So we do not have a motion. I thought I'd moved and seconded the discussion that we are going to the public again. So. I would re-move that we uh, move this bill as, as a minute. As a minute. Yeah. As a minute. Second. Second. Second to the substitute. Yeah. 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 Move to the substitute. Yeah. All right. We have a motion to report the substitute properly seconded. Clerk will open the roll. Will to take us on a field trip so I can wear my overalls. Yeah. <laughs> we should go check it out. We should go check it out. Jerry, 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 there you go. Okay, I've got to get it. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, which bill are we talking about? We have two bills on the top. No, it's the. Okay, so yeah. House Bill 14. Delegate Goodites. Thank you, um, Delegate uh, Chairman King. I, I am going to ask to continue this bill until next year. It's We've had too many substitutes, too many suggested changes, and an hour or half an hour, an hour before this sub started, I was handed seven more. <laughs> and my and you know this is going on in the Senate as well. It comes up in the Senate tomorrow, so I won't know what happens there. All things, um, all of this considered, I'm going to ask for it to be continued. But I want to make a comment to the stakeholders in the room. I encourage you to work on both from both sides of this. Reach out if the other people are not here in the room. But I encourage you to work on both sides of this and come to me with something that we can agree on. I would love to not see skinny and ill and slightly deformed or even sort of majorly deformed little tiny chihuahua puppies in the pet stores, okay? So let's let's work something out. Thank you. And with that, um, I would like I move to continue this. Okay, so Madam Chair, uh, at the, at the request of the patron, the motion, if there was to be one, would be to continue on the Rule 20. It is our motion. Second. Second. It is property motion and, and seconded to continue this on the Rule 22. That's the voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? If not, the motion carries. And I've never carried.